You've been studying these psychoactive compounds since the late 60s, right? Um, how has our general understanding of psychedelics changed since then? Well, in 1969, um, we were forced to call them psychotomimetics, which means mimicking drugs that mimic psychosis. So that's obviously not true. The Controlled Substance Act in 1970 was passed while I was a graduate student studying these drugs. Um, at that time, they were viewed as dangerous drugs of abuse. Um, and there was a big scare campaign put out by government officials and uh, the media, basically scaring people away from these. Um, the, the true facts were obscured by a lot of the media hype. Uh, we actually know now from John Ehrlichman's interview that the drug war started by President Richard Nixon was based on politics and not any danger of the drugs. Uh, they had the so-called hippies were smoking marijuana and taking LSD during the Vietnam War, protesting the war, and Richard Nixon wanted to keep them from being able to vote, so they passed the drug war knowing that these people were using drugs, and if they were convicted of drug use, then they could take their voting rights away. So the whole drug war was a cooked up thing to begin with. We know the same thing is true with marijuana. The Marijuana Tax Act that was passed in 1937 was completely bogus. Uh, Harry Anslinger, which was a drug warrior, convinced members of Congress that uh, Mexican laborers were bringing marijuana across the border to the United States, giving it to American women and raping them and killing them. So the drug war is a complete hoax to begin with. And that's sort of the framework that I started working in <laughs> 1969. Um, and as I began reading the literature, it became clear that these, these dangers were very much exaggerated. More recently, we've seen uh, studies that show that more than 30 million people have taken LSD without a single fatality directly from the drug. So psychedelics are probably the most safe in general, a CNS active drugs that are out there. They're safer than most of the conventional medications for depression and anxiety. Yep. So the landscape has changed quite a bit. And of course, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen clinical studies that have shown especially that psilocybin is safe and may be useful to treat a depression, treatment-resistant depression, alcohol use disorder, smoking uh, uh, addiction, et cetera. So the landscape has changed dramatically. The number of publications is escalating in almost an exponential fashion as people look at these as a new potential drugs for psychiatry. Psychiatry, of course, is the most conservative of all the medical specialties. They've had no new drugs. Um, the psychiatrist, if, you, if you're depressed, you go into, you don't even have to have a psychiatrist, you go into your general practitioner, your physician, they can prescribe you a drug for depression with really a, without much of anything else, including psychotherapy or, or uh, talk therapy or anything. So the, these drugs are being recognized as potentially very important uh, as compared with drugs that produce psychosis and kill you back in the Late late sixties when I started in the field. Yep. So we know they they do not induce psychosis or simulate schizophrenia, but what do they do? Well, in so the, the the key thing here is they don't cause mental illness in healthy mentally healthy people. In people who are susceptible to things like schizophrenia, they can initiate the onset of psychosis that can be permanent, can be very severe. But for healthy people. Uh, they're relatively safe when they're administered in a safe environment with someone to make sure that people don't walk out in the middle of roads or go rock climbing or swimming, things like that, while they're high on these substances. Um, the best definition that I like was in uh, Goodman and Gilman's Pharmacological Basis of Therapeutics in the seventh and eighth editions. There were chapters on uh, hallu hallucinogens, as they called them, and they said these are drugs that produce changes in thought, mood, and perception that are not or cannot be experienced otherwise except during dreaming or at times of religious exaltation. So that's a very peculiar definition, a formal definition for a class of drugs. It can give you an, a religious experience or they can represent what happens in a, in a lucid dream. So um, they're very powerful. They can produce personality changes. So someone asked me once, uh, what do you find fascinating about these drugs that you research them? And I said, well, think of the things that can change your life. You fall in love, you have a child, um, maybe a parent or sibling dies, uh, a child dies, you take a dose of LSD, and then I pause and to let that soak in. I said, think about that. You can ingest a minuscule amount of a, of a drug substance, tiny, tiny amount. It goes into your brain and resides there for a few hours. 
And for many people, they never see the world in the same way again, for better, for worse, most often for better. Um, they improve personality, uh, the personality trait of openness. So they seem to be very beneficial. And really, the government regulation has been 50 years of suppression of further research into these drugs. So we're seeing a real, what they call renaissance in research now. It's really encouraging. Yeah, have you received pushback in the in in those decades? Did you do you remember how what how the pushback showed itself? Well, I had to publish my early papers and call them psychotomimetics, which it wasn't true. And then for many years we called them hallucinogens, which also they don't produce hallucinations. When I started the Hefter Institute in 1993, our mission statement was to foster and promote and support studies legitimate studies of uh, psychedelics and we had some pretty big names in the field say oh don't call them psychedelics so they'll, they'll think you're a bunch of hippies you know you got to call them hallucinogens and i said no they're not hallucinogens they're psychedelics and so it's been and we promoted that this this is the legitimate name so you still see the more conservative uh, media outlets and politicians and attorneys and so forth call them hallucinogens but really, uh, the name psychedelic is really uh, increasing use in the population as people call these things what they really are. They're mind manifesting drugs. Yeah. You've studied the role of receptors in psychedelics extensively, of course, um, and why different psychedelics have different effects on the same receptor. And what did you find out? Well, there's a concept now. That, so the, the necessary receptor in the brain is called the serotonin 2A receptor. And uh, all of the psych classic psychedelics, um, psilocin, mescaline, LSD, um, they all activate or partially activate that receptor. What we know about receptors now, they used to think receptors were like on and off switches. You come into a room, you turn the light on, you turn the light off. Receptors don't actually work like that. They are more dynamic. They are, they're mobile. They kind of wiggle around in the membrane and they adopt different stable states. And so if a drug comes in that stabilizes one of those states, the receptor is locked in, it gives a, transmits a signal into the interior of the neuron and produces a certain signal. We now know that the nature of that signal depends upon what ligand is bound there. So normally the ligand for that receptor, the drug for that receptor is serotonin, which is a natural neurotransmitter. It's a small flexible molecule that interacts with all the serotonin receptors and changes the shape in the receptor and that transmits to the interior of the neuron and that activates a certain set of signaling uh, proteins. Well, L uh, serotonin goes in the receptor, comes back out, and the receptor does its thing. And it activates whatever uh, receptor components are, are in there coupled to it. LSD is a very big, rigid molecule. Um, it's very, we now know it's very difficult for it to actually get into the receptor. There's a piece of the receptor that covers over the binding domain that has to kind of scoot out of the way for LSD to get in there. So it's difficult for LSD to get in the receptor. Hmm. We've shown in receptor experiments, isolated experiments, that once LSD gets in there, it takes eight to 10 hours for it all to get back out. So LSD is a long acting compound, it's very potent. And part of that is probably related to the fact that once it gets into the receptor, it stays there for a long time. Hmm. You, look at, so you look at psilocin, which is the active drug from psilocybin, um, and it's a four to six hour duration of action. It probably gets in, gets back out. It's not locked in the receptor like LSD is. So some of the effects are related to the nature of the drug that binds to the receptor, what shape that puts the receptor in, and then that determines what signaling pathways are activated within um, the, the neuron. Yeah, so the receptor itself changes around the, the active it's, substance. Yeah, most We know most proteins are, are mobile, recept enzymes, mm -hmm. Um, also are mobile, they adapt to the substrate. So these receptors, there are seven alpha helices in kind of a bundle in the membrane, and they have a certain normal shape. And when they're activated, their shape changes. And how they're activated and the shape change depends on what the ligand is that binds, whether it's mescaline or DMT or LSD, it actually determines the nature of the signal that occurs within the neuron. So there's some of that. Now, there may be some other things that happen. For example, all of the classic psychedelics also activate a receptor called the 5-HT2C receptor. Mm. They don't have a pure 2A receptor activator. And the 2C receptor will functionally antagonize or work against 
activation of the 2A receptor. So we don't know what would happen if we had a pure 2A agonist. So LSD, psilocybin, they'll activate the 2C receptor. LSD activates a whole bunch of other receptors as well, uh, dopamine receptors, alpha receptors. And so we don't know whether those actually affect the qualitative nature. So what we can say is activation of the serotonin 2A receptor is a necessary, but not necessarily sufficient event for the qualitative nature of the intoxication. So just a 2A activation produces certain effect, but all these things that LSD does in addition may relate to some of its differences from things like psilocybin or mescaline. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of room for uh, new research there. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of research going on. And of course, now you have all these companies trying to make money in this space, trying to invent new psychedelics that are not known so they can have intellectual property protection. So we'll yep. see, so probably see some new ones come out of that. Um, a little better understanding the lab where I'm working now, Brian Ross Laboratory at UNC Chapel Hill, he has a big grant to study how these drugs activate the receptors. And there's a lot of structural biology work. They're crystallizing structures that have serotonin, psilocin, LSD, uh, and benzoyl compounds actually bound in them and looking at the shape changes that occur, or what are the features of the receptor, they're mutating amino acids. So we're going to have a very detailed understanding of the molecular biology of these drugs and how they interact with their, their receptors. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to look forward to your talk. What is it going to be on? Um, do you uh, already know? I haven't actually put it together yet. I will <laughs> probably give some background and talk about natural sources, uh, peyote, um, mushrooms, ergot alkaloids. I'll probably give some uh, background because people there won't understand how receptors work. So I'll probably talk about receptors some. Um, maybe Again, it's what it's a 40 minute talk, I think. Um, so, you know, I can't talk about all the things I know, obviously. <laughs> um, so I'll try to pick some things that I think will appeal to a general audience in terms of just informing them about the basic science. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of talks about clinical studies and uh, shamanism and so forth, but I will probably focus more on the basic science, how the receptors work and where they are and the kind of signals they generate and how that could affect consciousness. And will you contrast the active in substances with their sort of natural occurrence and see how the differences are different when you take sort of the, the natural organism containing the substance contrasted with the substance all by itself? Is that how you should look at it? Um, well, what I'll do is, for example, I will probably show a picture of a peyote cactus and I'll show uh, the structure of mescaline, which is inside of the peyote cactus. And I'll talk about the, the dose of it, what potency it has, how long it lasts. Um, and that's a natural product, but you could synthesize molecules related to mescaline. And Sasha Shulgin and I have probably made a total of 200 to 300 molecules that are based on that phenethylamine template. And so a lot of those he's described in Pical in his big book. Um, but some of them, I mean, have minor you know, differences in psychopharmacology. The problem is, there haven't been clinical studies done with most of those. And so people have beliefs about what they do. Even within Sasha's group, I, I criticized him once because Sasha within his group was revered as sort of an icon. He was the God of psychedelics, if you will. And anything he said was taken as gospel. And I told him he had this, he had this group of people on the West Coast. That if he made a new molecule and took it and said, well, I, this molecule has these effects in me, he would give it to Anne and say, this is the effect it had on me. And she'd take it. And of course, she would agree with him in most cases. Well, that's what happened. So then if he went to his group and weighed out samples for them, he'd say, well, Anne and I have took it and it has this effect. And I said, you know, that's that's really not a good way to do it because you biased your group. You should say you should just say, Anne and I found it to be active and we're interested in what your comments are. But he told people what effect it had. And that really contaminated people's views because with psychedelics you can really um, people can really be persuaded of things and Sasha was such a big figure in the underground and people I mean there was one person that wanted to nominate him for a Nobel Prize in chemistry and other people I mean he was just the kind of the grandfather the godfather so he really um, biased his group a lot in my opinion so we don't really yeah. know you can read Picall and there may be some that are in like 2CB is one that he developed and everybody agrees that it's not very visual, but it's, very, it's more like sort of an MDMA type compound. And so there's some basic things like that that you can see, but 
make it a subtle difference between two molecules which are very closely related structurally. You'd have to do a big clinical study, do all kinds of uh, instruments, questionnaires and things to really determine are these two molecules producing different effects? And nobody's really done that. I mean, this research has been stifled for more than 50 years by drug regulation. Yeah, so so much. It's a it's a it's a brave new world. I would almost say there's a lot of room for research uh, left. So that's uh, that's great, and that's what we're going to do next month. So, Mr. Nichols, thanks so much for uh, for talking to us today, and uh, see you uh, at ICPR. Yep, my pleasure. Also, my pleasure.